do, 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 do. Oh. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Boy, it's not morning. It's afternoon. It is 2.01. Ooh, minute late. My bad, everyone. So we'll just wait a couple seconds here because it takes about, oh, I think about a minute. Oh, hello, Linda. Welcome to Bible study. And Jean, oh, this is wonderful. Um, give me just a second here. Got to turn off. I don't get any pop-ups. 2 p.m. did come quick today, Maggie. I feel the same way. All of a sudden, I was doing work and other reading other things, and suddenly I went, oh, oh, it's 2 o'clock. I should probably get over there. People will be uh, waiting for me. I don't want to be late. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Well, we are continuing in Genesis. If you didn't... Uh, weren't here yesterday, if you had a busy Monday, didn't make it, we are working through Genesis. We made it through the seven days of creation yesterday. So that's Genesis 1 into three verses in chapter 2. That's how far we got yesterday, uh, looking at God's gift to us in, um, in Genesis. And so um, we are, that's where we are. So let us begin here. Oh, that might have been a silly page. Sorry, everyone. I'm a little slow on the uptake today. So, let us uh, continue um, with Genesis 2, verse 4. Um, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created at their creation. In the day God made them, uh, the the earth and the heavens. Okay, so uh, we're getting a little bit more info. That's what this is all about. Um, the generations usually mean um, laying out of people, uh, but here we get a laying out of at least one day uh, of creation, a little bit more zoomed in view on the creation of, well, mankind. That's really what we're looking at uh, today is Genesis 2, the creation of mankind. Um, uh, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Um, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living, um, became a living creature. Okay, um, so what is going on here in verse 5? Um, this is talking about sort of there's no fields. That's, that's what's going on here. Um, so bush of the field is, in, is important. Um, this field language is, is kind of, well, if I were to go um, do Blair Witch style and carry the, uh, the laptop upstairs and show you out my front door, you would see some of this some um, grass of the field, these these cultivated areas. That's literally where I live, in the middle of fields. Um, and that's what's going on here. It's not that um, there were no plants at all. Um, it's that there was no cultivation, no farming going on at this point. Um, and there really wasn't rain. And there was no man. So this sort of describes um, sort of the way of the world on day six, is that there's... Everything's sort of there, but there's no man. There's all sorts of plants. Um, Lestico. Oh, don't worry, Lestico. You've got you you've you've had two days uh, to work up material. Uh, Pastor Borkart should be back tomorrow, so you know if you didn't have time yesterday to work up your material, well, you've got one whole extra day to save up uh, for Pastor Borkart. Um, I'm just here to yesterday and today. So, uh, no man. Uh, let's see. Mist was going up, rather. Um, 
Then the Lord God forms the man from the dust of the earth. Well, and here we go. Here's more water language. We sort of miss this. Um, and this is why um, it's in Isaiah where Isaiah starts talking about, you know, potters and, and clay. Um, that it's echoing back here to Genesis that, that I guess in some sense, without having really dived into that passage, um, it just sort of came to mind. Um, it's possible Isaiah is is preaching on this passage. Sometimes you'll get that in, in the uh, in the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah is a good example. Um, and now I'm blanking on all the psalm. He's pre he preaches on a psalm. Um, oh boy, it's going to bug me now. Well, we'll see if it comes to me. Um, so, but this is what he's talking about. This mist. This isn't just like dry dust. Is it's it's clay, it's mud. It's mud that um, God is using. So again, the create creation involves water, even the creation of mankind. We're sort of given sort of the big picture um, in in Genesis one, you know, kind of zoomed out view. God makes everything, and oh by the way, He made man and woman. He made mankind. Um, and here we get the more intimate view of how God, how does the Lord God do this? And when it comes to this intimate reality, we have now God's name. So there the Lord, Yahweh himself, um, forms man. He gets his hands dirty, so to speak. Um, and he uses mud to create Adam. He makes him from dust from the ground. Um, and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man, become, and man becomes alive. He's a living soul. Um, and a lot of this language here is also echoed in the Gospel of John. Um, so when Jesus uh, has to heal a blind man, he does it by creating mud and putting it on his eyes. He shows himself to be the creator by doing that, that he's he's basically making a patch. He's patching up the dude's eyes, giving him new eyes, using mud to do it, just like, well, uh, Jesus does here, the, 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 the son. Because again, uh, as Paul says in Colossians, the son is the image of the invisible God. And that's even the case in the Old Testament. So whenever you see God, an appearance of God, it's going to be the Son. He's always bearing witness. He's the messenger of God. And he also breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Um, and uh, here we get language that echoes in John 20, where the apostles, uh, Jesus breathes on them to give them the Holy Spirit. It's all the same thing. Um, there's nothing new under the sun for the Lord. He's doing the same thing, just in a different way. In, in a different way, meaning um, he reveals everything in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's where it all starts to become clear to us um, in who Jesus is and what he does for us. So he forms him, makes him a living creature. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Um, okay, so uh, there's the Eden in the east. Uh, and this east language comes up time and time again uh, in, the, in the rest of Genesis. Well, the early parts of Genesis, uh, where there's you're driven eastward. They're driven eastward out of the garden. So to get back to the garden, you've got to go west. Um, which uh, will lay out the why the tabernacle is ordered the way it is, where to get into the tabernacle, you go west. Um, but there's no tabernacle in Genesis. But just to sort of put that in your mind, that God, again, doing the same thing, just sort of clarifying what's going on. Um, well, glad you could be here, Will. Super glad. Sorry the notification didn't go out. Hmm. Pesky Facebook sometimes. Um, oh, garden, garden being um, listed here. This would also be why um, John wants to make the point in his gospel where you have the it is finished language of Calvary. And then there's the Sabbath language, rest in the tomb. And then the next thing he starts talking about is Mary Magdalene in the, in the garden. That's why there's a garden. That's why John wants to make, make us realize, you know, where that tomb is located. Because, again, he's wanting to echo us back to Genesis. Um, granted, 
the the days are a little bit different, but that's the the theology of what's going on is it's it's all related. It's all related that the death and resurrection of Jesus restore to us paradise, restore to us access uh, to the Garden of Eden, or um, as it is in Revelation, the access to the tree of life. But we're not there yet. That's more Genesis three language. Let's let's keep going here. So what happens in this garden? Out of the garden, out of the ground, uh, the Lord God uh, f- formed every tree uh, that is pleasant to the sight and good for eating. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we don't, um, we have the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we don't want to say that it's the tree of death, though that's the consequence of eating it. It's not the tree of death. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it gives you that. But we're not there yet. That's more, again, Genesis 3. Well, a little bit at the end of two when, when the Lord gives his word about what these trees are for, uh, but we're not there yet. Here we're just told there's all sorts of trees, pleasant to the sight and good for food. So here again, creation is always meant as a gift. The Garden of Eden as a gift um, for mankind. That's what the Lord himself is doing. That's always, that's creation. All right. Ooh, geography lesson. Here we go. Genesis 2, 10. Um, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. Uh, The name of the first is the Pishon. It is one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. Um... So, uh, well, I'll just read it all, and then we'll come back and talk about it. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Um, So here we're given um, sort of a geography lesson about all these four rivers. Um, And what Delium is, nobody knows. Um, if you, if you must know, if you're interested, this weird stone, um, is that it's right here. Um, uh, bedolach is the word which gets translated into the Greek as delium, delian. Uh, it's just, we don't know what it is. They would have known, but we don't know. In the same way, um, this geography, we don't understand. Even Luther understands this in his day that, well, there's been several thousand years between when this happened and today and the fact that there was a worldwide flood. And so there's no way to know exactly where these rivers are. Um, and and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So if we're going to try and locate where the Garden of Eden is, it's sort of foolish at this point. From our perspective, um, the flood did a lot of damage to the earth. And besides that, um, well, yeah, it's just going to change anyway. The The way that certain rivers flow is different now than they were even, you know, a hundred years ago. So it's just, all that stuff changes. So we don't, again, want to use this as now a, ge- a geography textbook in order to, um, that tells us exactly where to find the Garden of Eden. Because again, not really the point of the book. Um, It's not a science book. It's not a geography book. It's a story about who God is and who he is for you and how he saves you. That's the, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation uh, 22, whatever, however many verses are in the last chapter of Revelation. So what does God do with this garden? So he he plants his garden. That's what he does uh, for man. And this is what he does. He, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden uh, to work it and keep it. Indiana Jones and the Search um, of the Four Rivers. Well, thank you, Lestico, for that nice Wikipedia article on Delium. Um, 
I didn't know that. Thank you. Indiana Jones and the Search for the Four Rivers. That's what we need. That sounds like a good movie. Let's do it. Let's get, uh, we'll get Sandra Madden on producing that, that, uh, it's in some government warehouse next to the Ark. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's the name of that show? Warehouse 13. There we go. We can do a, an HT movie in the universe of Warehouse 13, which was a show on sci-fi. Oh, um, oh, was that like probably five, ten years ago? Perfect, Sandra. Get on that movie. Uh, is the keep here? Oh, yes. So the man is, uh, let's see here. I took the man and he, um, oh, uh, gave him sanctuary in the Garden of, of Eden um, to work it and to keep it, to guard it. Um, now, the language here actually echoes language that's in Leviticus that the priests are given um, the duty to guard the charge of the Lord. That is, they are positioned in the camp um, around the tabernacle for this exact purpose, to, to guard the charge of the Lord. And so this is a liturgical term as it's being used here in Genesis. So Adam is here not just as like a gardener, um, but as a priest. That's the idea here. And, and we'll, we'll get more of this understanding um, once we hit uh, Genesis 3 uh, in how the Lord God talks to Adam and what his role was with Eve, his wife. Um, it's not simply uh, being a good gardener. It it's in, involves the preaching of, of God's word. And um, that's already hinted at here. Um. So yeah, this this language here to keep it is is sort of it seems odd. Like why does he have to protect it? But again, this is this is a liturgical term. So he's serving as not just gardener but priest. Um, and the Lord God commanded the man. Ooh, yes. Yeah, see, so if if, if uh, Adam is priest, next we need word, don't we? Uh, and next comes word of God. And the Lord God commanded the man um, from every tree of the garden, um, you may surely eat. Um, the language there is like, you can, you can eatingly eat, would be literally the Hebrew. Um, you're going to just eat your fill. Eat and eat and eat some more is the idea. So um, again, it's, a, it's like the Lord wants Adam to have a party. Feast up, Adam. That's what you're here in the garden for. Um, sure, the entire world is a gift um, for Adam. But here specifically, this garden is this place of being able to party and feast. And as we will see in Genesis 3, is a place where the Lord God comes to meet with Adam, um, to meet with his people. That's that's really the purpose of the garden is is the meeting place between mankind and the Lord God. So you may eat your fill of every tree. However, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat uh, because on the day you eat of it, you're going to um, surely die. The, the language here is the same as eating of all the trees, which would include the tree of life. Um, you will dyingly die. You're going to die. You're going to be on this path of just dying, 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 dying some more. It's just a little bit each day. It's not drop dead. It's going to be, um, it's just sort of what we're living with. Um, uh, people get sick and sometimes they get better and sometimes they don't. Sometimes it lingers. Sometimes they never really get better until they die. It's sort of, that's our experience. Um, sometimes people just drop dead, but now we have, I think this, we do understand this, especially with, um, with certain people with the coronavirus, if there's more serious long-term consequences for some people, I think that this understanding of dying and dying and dying on this path of death, uh, makes a little bit more sense to us in our time. 
sadly, sad to say, it's not a good thing. And here again, it's, so why is the treat, um, uh, there's two, there, there's trees given for eating and trees given for not eating. And that's sort of, we struggle with that. Um, but why create it? Well, it was given for not eating. Um, you know, there's all sorts of women in the world, but only one is given to me as a gift, as a wife. Well, then why did he create all the other women? That doesn't make any sense. But that's sort of what we try and do with these two, with these trees. Well, he shouldn't have even created it. Well, then maybe the Lord shouldn't create any, have it, have only created my wife, no other women. That would, that would make my life easier. Or for you, for your, you know, just in whatever it is, we're trying to, to tell God how to do things, which is, of course, the original sin, but we're, we're not there yet in Genesis 3. Um, uh, Luther would talk about how this is, this is part of the worship, um, that mankind is given a means of worship, that is, to show up in the garden and to, for one, um, eat of the tree of life, and two, to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and to preach on that word of God. And we can see that this at least took place once uh, in Genesis 3. Um, but again, we're not there yet. It's hard to it's hard to sort of hold this all in tension without telling the rest of the story. But um, I also don't want to steal Borkhart's thunder, but Lestigo would cheer me on to do, to do exactly that. So maybe I will. Um, but Adam preaches on this word to Eve. And that's sort of how she she finds out about it. So because the word of God is given here to Adam, well he's not Adam yet, but he to the man, um, and then he preaches on this, um, and that's what this is all about. Here again is more worship language that the God doesn't just give first article gifts, that is um, gifts that have to do with this body and life. He's always trying to uh, operate in the realm of trust in Him. And so God gives these, this, these trees for eating. We trust him for that. Uh, we, he gave this tree for not eating. We trust him for that too. And he gives us this word and we trust that too. And we would delight to hear that word. Um, and that's the, the relationship that's set up already in, in Eden. Okay. And the Lord God said, it's not good. That the man would be alone. I will fashion for him a helper. I will make a helper fit for him. Um, an a uh, an azer uh, an el uh, a helper comparable to him. Okay, so this should be if we were really reading. And I wasn't doing so much commentary, which is fine. I'm not saying that that's bad. Like I should, it's the, that this should be a striking passage because the refrain throughout Genesis one is that everything is good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Everything's very good at the end. Uh, but you get this point in day six um, that we're, we're kind of brought into is that something is not good. And you're like, well, what's that? The man is alone. And so the Lord's going to make a helper uh, fit for him. I don't particularly like that. Um, the idea here is that um, it's a helper complementary to him. That's what's going on. That in some ways, the man and the woman will be equal. Um, who they are before God, lots of things are equal. We're not trying to, to set up um, a certain worldview about the relationship between men and women. Um, but we are going to say that there's certain things that um, uh, my wife compliments me uh, and I compliment her and that that's okay. That's just sort of the way it was from Adam and Eve. Everybody's given their own gifts. Um, the Lord talks this way through Paul in Corinthians about, um, you know, there's the body, not all things are the same in the body. Um, the eye can't bemoan being not being a hand, and the hand can't be upset about be, not being an eye. Um, we all have gifts and abilities. Um, Lestico's ability is to, you know, 
uh, draw Pastor Borkhart off into, you know, crazy land, usually bad songs, which is maybe not a good gift from, from Pastor Lestico, but it is what it is. Um, or, you know, uh, whatever those gifts are. We all know this in our daily lives. And the Lord sets it up this way with Adam and Eve. Um, Adam's not supposed to be boss man. Um, and even supposed to be subservient or a slave in some way to Adam. No, um, complementary. Each has their role, each has their gifts from the Lord. And uh, we rejoice in that. All right, so God says it's not good. And now we're going to move to show that Adam will figure out that it's not good. That's fair point, Pastor Lesko. I shouldn't have thrown you under the bus like that. You're, that's a fair point. Um, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and all every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he will call him. And whatever he called him... Uh, Every living creature, that was its name. So, the man gave, called names for all the, the, the livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper complementary to him. There was no compliment to him. Um, and so here is the shift to calling him Adam for the I would say for the rest of the chapter. I would say that there's a there's a funny thing with the Hebrew dots and squiggles um, that lets us know that um, so that it is the man gives names, but for Adam, and then for the rest of the chapter it's the Adam, but don't worry, it's, this is the shift where now um, I would say the rest of the chapter it's, it's talking to Adam specifically because it just makes sense. And here we also know um, that Adam's a smart cookie because he figures out where he came from based on how the Lord brings all the animals to him. Adam figures out he's from the ground. That's why the Lord does it that way. So Adam's able to figure out, one, he's not alone, and two, uh, the... Uh, how the Lord made him. So you could not find anyone complimentary to him. So uh, the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib uh, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. Uh, made into he made okay and brought her to the man okay to Adam so here um, is going to be side language um, it can be rib um, but here it is also side the, the, the Septuagint puts it that way uh, which also again so I'm repeating myself, ties it to the Gospel of John. This is why in John's language, they pierce Christ's side with a, um, a spear. Um, and blood and water come out. Where um, the church, according to Ephesians 5, is sanctified with the washing of water with the word. And he also Christ also nourishes her um, with his body and blood. And so here we're tied again to the Gospel of John. Okay, brought her to the man. And the man said, uh, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, um, a man will leave his father and mother and cl cling to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's 2 verse 24. Um. So here again, um, 
is the, the, the marriage language again. So man leaves his father and mother. And Paul would tell us in Ephesians 5 that this verse actually has nothing to do with Adam and Eve. Um, that it has everything to do with Christ and the church. Because it's an odd statement. Um, and it seems by Paul's comments on this passage that he's taking it to be in in... At least it could be taken as, as Adam still continuing. But there's no talk of either way. It doesn't matter. It's odd. It's odd. Because there's, at this point, no father or mother at all. And besides that, it if we're especially talking about the ancient world, when Moses would have written this, um, the man never left his father and mother. I mean, we have lots of accounts of women doing that. Lots of accounts of women doing that in the Old Testament. And lots of just not even in the Bible, outside the Bible too. In fact, that's still kind of our experience today. Um, or or more so our experience is um, two uh, people go, you know, go off to college. That's a common thing, right? Two people go off to college, they get married and then go move somewhere else. Um, yeah, there's no parents. Um, and so this is an odd statement. And Paul recognizes this and goes, ah, this is actually about Christ and the church, which then echoes um, the side language uh, of John 19, John 20, uh, the, the, the water and blood language that echoes from the, that comes from Christ's side, then echoes Ephesians 5, where Paul makes this point. It's all circular here, and it's all right here in Genesis. And this passage also Jesus uses. This would be another anchor passage where we get to, well, how, did this really happen this way? And, well, Jesus seems to think so. He cites it as an example. Um, and if Jesus, being God, knew that it didn't happen this way, it would be a little bit dishonest of him uh, to be uh, citing this as a rationale for divorce being bad and not what God wants. Um not the way God intended it from the beginning. Um, so here again, we're, we're, we're drawn by Jesus back to these passages. Uh, Jesus, as an aside, um, Jesus' comments on the Old Testament often involve the passages we have the most trouble with today. So passages like uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, uh, passages like... Um, uh, I just... Where did it go? Ah, Jonah being uh, swallowed by the by the fish or whale, whichever. Um, large sea animal. Um, so whichever that those passages are the ones Jesus himself uses. Um, I'd almost say anticipating uh, uh, would be very godlike of him now, wouldn't it? Uh, anticipating uh, future worries and concerns. Um, so here again, why do we believe Genesis 1 and 2 are true? You can run the route of, well, it's God's word. But that's sort of an abstract idea. An idea that, well, what makes our holy book better than any other holy book? Why is our creation narrative any more true than um, the Quran Or the, the myths of the Native Americans? Or um, the Epic of Gilgamesh or something? What what makes ours different? If it's all just a claim, base claim of, well, mine is God's word. Well, yeah, but they say theirs is God's word. Well, how do we prove that? I mean, we could go with, well, certain things came true. Well, they can probably do the same thing. Well, the, th the thing that they don't have is a God, a teacher, well, we'll start there, a man who claimed to be God, who said, I'm going to die and come back to life on the third day. And then we have lots of eyewitness testimony that, well, he actually did that thing. And when you start there and you go, well, what else does this Jesus man have to say who's God? Well, he anchors us to Genesis 1 and 2. And I, I would say lots of the other portions of Genesis. And so that's where we go. We start with Jesus and then we go, Genesis is true because Jesus rose from the dead and he ties us there. And so we can take comfort about how God is towards us 
in creating the universe for us, in blessing us with a place uh, where he would interact with us. Uh, the, the Garden of Eden is all about that. We can rejoice that he still does that, as he's always wanted for mankind. He, he doesn't cast us off. He sends his son for us who died and rose for us. Uh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So here again, um, here could be more Calvary language, John 19, which is, which is really wonderfully put in the hymn, In the Shattered Bliss of Eden. I believe we have that as a, is that a, Sandra will correct me. She might even post a link to it. Um, it was our conference hymn, um, either last year or the year before. Boy, it's getting the end of Bible, class, Bible study. I'm getting a little tired. Um, but Pastor Starkey, um, the uh, Pastor Starkey wonderfully puts this that um, Adam and Eve um, were naked and unashamed, and then they they were shamed. They put clothes their own clothes on, uh, but that Christ um, uh, saves us, restores us back to a, a place of not having to be ashamed before God. Um, by dying for us in, uh, in naked shame. But again, I'm foreshadowing Genesis 3. At 2.37, hmm. Well, let's start stealing Pastor Borkhart's thunder, why don't we? Let's, that's what we're going to do. I might even go over just to, just to, just to make that happen. So we, we've got, the, the universe is created, um, uh, the universe is, here, I'll make myself big. So the universe is created in Genesis 1 over seven seven days. Well, creation happens over six days. Um, and then seventh day, God rests. Um, and then we get zoomed in view on the creation of mankind, where God's name is suddenly used. Um, which is why some might want to say, well, there's two different sources here. Uh, well, there's two different theological points being made in these two chapters. Which, if you're going to make two different points, it would make sense you would use slightly different language to make those two points. And so all, we have Genesis. We can rejoice in um, what Moses gives us in talking about God creating the universe in six days. And also then tying his personal name to the intimate creation of mankind. Of creating Adam from the mud and then creating Eve from a piece of Adam's side and, you know, walking her down the aisle uh, in the first marriage ceremony. Um, and now things get all messed up. Now, the serpent. Oops, let's get you the text. Uh, let's not do that. There we are. Now, the serpent was more crafty. Then all the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, Did God really say that you may not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of any tree in the gar of the trees of the garden. Okay. Um, we're going to blow past the fact that Eve talks to a snake and... Um, doesn't seem to bother her. I don't know what to make of that. Um, I don't, I really don't. Um, could animals talk? I don't, I don't know as if that's the point. It's not the point of the text for us to learn um, the biology and the relationship between um, the people and animals. Um, the, the relationship here is going to be one of, um, uh, between us and God. That's the true nature of Genesis 3. Um, and the serpent is the devil. Revelation makes that clear. Um, but I thought I'd make a comment on that. Um, we can eat from any tree of the garden. And this is how the devil starts, always casting doubt on the Lord's word. That's his first track uh, attack. Uh, uh, attack. Um, so he does that in the temptation of Jesus. Um so Jesus is told that he is the son of God, and then the devil continually, the first two temptations, goes, if you really are the son of God. So their first doubt, um, 
So that's what the serpent. Oh, okay. But what does God say? But from the tree that is in the midst of the garden, you may not eat for in the day you eat of it. Uh, neither shall you touch it lest you die. You shan't, you will not touch it. Um, so here Eve, um, Eve changes God's word. And I don't know how much we can make of that. Um, some people try to make a lot out of that. Um, and I go back and forth on that. I mean, it's possible that this is already sort of in one question, the devil has, um, really found the Achilles heel for Eve. Um, but I don't, the other possibility is that, well, who did she hear this word from? She heard it from Adam. And that's not to say Adam didn't, you know, it's not, I'm not trying to say Adam messed up his preaching, but what I would say is that Adam used more words to deliver God's word to Eve, which is sort of what hap well, one is happening right now as I'm teaching a Bible class. This is what God's word is saying right here. Or a sermon. It's the same way. Otherwise, you would just repeat, I would just get up there. I'm preaching on the gospel, and I'll just read it again, and then I'll sit down. Um, as awesome as that would mean for my free time during the week, um, that's not that's not preaching. Um, but um, that's what I'm saying here is that it's possible Eve is is changing it. Um, okay, um, could just be that. Well, Adam preached a sermon on it, and she's just using the language of what she heard from from Adam. Um, Adam wasn't sinning by doing that. Um, the, the real sin is, is coming in a, in a couple verses. Um, lest you die, right? So it's, it's a little softened. Okay. Uh, but the serpent said, you will not surely die. Um, so you will not surely die. And here the devil just calls God a liar. Um, so you will not, it's the same form that God says, you, you, the day that you eat of it, you will dyingly die. And here he, he repeats God's word, except says, that's not what's going to happen. You're not going to drop dead is, the, is sort of the way that it ends up being interpreted. You're not going to die, die and die some more. You're not going to be on this path to death. What's really going to happen? Well, verse five, because God knows that on the day that you eat of it, uh, you, uh, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. You'll be God. You'll be just like God. That's what he knows. Um, one, this is a continuation of the lie. They already were like God. They were made in his image, in his likeness. You can't get much more God-like than that as he sets it up in his, his created order. But here the devil is trying to say, well, there's more. God's holding out on you. You'll, you'll be more like God if you do this. Um, and they already knew what was evil. Don't eat of it. But again, well, this is what happens. Well, the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was desirable to make one wise. She took from the from its fruit and ate. And she gave uh, some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Um, so her ears are off the Lord's word, and now her eyes are on uh, what is not gift from the Lord. So the Lord's word has been, um, this is stealing from Pastor Buto, um, from a sermon that he gave one time, Pastor Borkert, I saw he made a comment, might uh, bring this up. Um, the word of the Lord gets removed from the tree and the words of the devil get go into the eyes of Eve and she sees this fruit and she eats. And Adam, bonehead, is right there. He's right there and he doesn't do anything. In fact, he just eats it. Well, she didn't drop dead. It's probably okay. Um, Adam doesn't rescue her. It's going to get worse. Then the eyes of their that were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the 
the voice, uh, the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden um, at the cool of the day or the wind of the day. Um, they hear they hear the wind blow and they're they're afraid that God's going to get them, and so they they hide. Uh, they hid themselves in the presence of the gar of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So things are not good in trouble in paradise. Um, so now they are, uh, they know good and evil. And what does this mean? They're ashamed of each other. They try and cover themselves and they're afraid of God. They're afraid of the Lord God who had given them all good things as a gift. And so they hide. Um, in the cool of the day, the wind of the day, um, they hear a tree branch snap and it'd be like if you're walking in the woods, right? And you're by yourself. And suddenly you hear a tree, a twig snap behind you. You're going to be like, oh, that's a bear. It's going to get me. That's how they, um, that is how they feel about being in the presence of God right now. But what does the Lord God do? Um, I will, let's see here. Where do I want to stop? Hmm. But the, uh, we'll stop there. We'll stop there. Because otherwise I'm going to have to keep going and Sandra will get mad at me. So, Pastor Borkhart will be back tomorrow uh, to pick up here in Genesis. Um, well, he could probably start in 3 verse 8 to get himself some um, some running room. Um, 3 verse 8 um, is where we're stopping. So, thank you for joining me. Hopefully it was helpful to, to dive into Genesis chapter two and a little bit of chapter three. Um, I might be back next week at some point, probably Monday, if not more days, but we will see. Um, the uh, Other than that, have a good rest of your day. Same time tomorrow, two o'clock. I'll, I'll try and be here, but Pastor Borkhart will be here uh, certainly to teach you on the rest of Genesis three. Thank you so much. Have a good day.